Welcome everyone. Thanks a lot, Nishant, for the invitation to speak. Um, it's impossible to completely avoid complications in the EP lab, but we'll talk about strategies for kind of minimizing uh, and managing complications as they occur. Here are my disclosures. So just as an overview, we'll talk about uh, minimizing device complications. We'll talk about minimizing uh, complications during ablation procedures. And at the end, I'll have a few slides um, on just sort of strategies for kind of addressing complications uh, when they occur. So in terms of minimizing complications, I'm just, uh, this is, I don't know that there's really a right or wrong answer here, but out of curiosity, um, maybe you guys could, could uh, weigh in on what you quote um, as the rate of a major complication um, for CIAD implantation. Let it go for maybe a minute or so. I thought it was 50 50. You might be on your Peloton during this. <laughs> there was a chance. I'll have to go later. Okay, great. So, um, it looks like the uh, majority said less than 1% uh, risk of a major complication. For us, for whatever it's worth, we quote a 2 to 3% overall risk of a complication. And I think most people would agree that less than 1% for a major complication. OK, um, what do uh, kind of the observational studies tell us about the actual rates of pacemaker complications? So this is a review of 72,000 now pacemaker implantations uh, published in 2017. These were older men mostly, um, the majority of whom had um, the majority of whom had um, dual chamber uh, pacemakers placed. Um, these were implanted in 2010 to March 2014. And as you can see, uh, the acute rate of complication, and these were pretty legitimate complications, including infection, thoracic trauma, you know, pocket issues, which may or may not require intervention. But in the acute phase in one month, uh, the rate of complication was seen to be about 9% overall. And what made up the majority of that? Um, endocarditis, actually, um, you know, not just a little bit of skin infection. Um, occurred at over half a percent. Um, thoracic trauma occurred quite frequently at three and a half percent or a little bit above that. Um, and lead complication requiring revision um, was also a major issue. In terms of long-term complications, um, the percentage was about five to six percent. Again, with lead complications being a major issue um, and infection kind of rounding that out as well. One thing to kind of notice, um, and you've probably heard this from your attendings, is to be very um, judicious about the use of um, adding an atrial lead, if that's something that's really needed or not. It's clear that patients with um, dual chamber devices had a higher percentage of their complications made up of lead complications, um, both in the short term and in the long term. And if we look at the actual numbers, you can see that uh, both the risk of a lead complication requiring revision, um, as well as the risk of thoracic trauma, either pneumothorax or hemothorax was higher in patients who had that additional lead placed. So it may seem trivial at, that, at the time, but statistically speaking, you're more likely to cause um, a complication with the additional lead. So why were those numbers so high compared to the numbers that we sort of quote our patients and that we think of? It may be that many of those 70,000 pacemakers were placed in centers with less experience than more experience. This I think is a very useful study um, from Germany looking at 430,000 pacemaker implants um, and looking at significant complications, meaning those requiring intervention. So not just a hemat pocket hematoma that someone watched, you know, this was something that required re-intervention. And you can see that there's a significant um, trend toward a lower rate of complication in sort of the higher volume centers, um, especially when it comes to pneumothorax, maybe not so different in terms of effusion as that's infrequently occurring. Um, and hematomas were also less likely to occur. 
Most significantly, however, was the issue of lead dislocation and the need for reintervention. And you can see at the lower volume centers, um, the risk of lead dislocation was more than two times higher than those at the higher volume centers. And so, you know, practice, practice, practice. Um, you know, the more you do, the, the better you will be. Um, pneumothorax. So let's talk about pneumothorax specifically. So um, we'll talk specifically about the history of endocardial lead replacement, because uh, uh, lead placement, that's because it's fun. Um, so the first description of a transvenous lead being placed was in 1959, and that was actually through the right basilic vein here, can you imagine? Um, and uh, there was a high rate of lead dislodgement, um, as you could imagine. The second choice was the external jugular vein here. Um, cephalic cutdown actually came next in the 1960s, um, but actually gave way uh, later on with the advent of peel away sheets um, that allowed access to kind of like the bigger uh, vessels and the medial subclavian approach became very uh, commonly used. Um, you can imagine how that would be associated with a high risk of pneumothorax and hemothorax um, at a rate of one to three percent and lead fracture also was a common issue. This is a an example of a patient with a very medially positioned lead. You can see the turn of the first rib here, which is typically what we target these days. And you can see that this lead has fractured. Those leads went through the costoclavicular ligaments um, or it could be crushed by um, the subclavian muscle itself. Um, I had a patient who did a thousand push-ups a day and he managed to um, crush his lead. So, um, so uh, with all of those issues, new kind of approaches were um, sort of sought after. And in 1992, Bird kind of um, uh, described the extra thoracic approach that many of us use today, using the first rib as kind of a floor, a hard stop for our needle um, in getting access to the axillary subclavian vein. Um, and then the use of venography was added to kind of improve the precision. And this extra thoracic approach was compared to the cephalic approach um, in this study in 2001. Here, uh, patients were randomized to either the extra thoracic approach or the cephalic approach. Um, I think cephal the cephalic approach may not be um, very commonly used, um, but, uh, the, and this may be a reason why, the rate of successful implant is about two thirds. The venous access time does take a little bit longer with sort of the cut down. Um, the total procedural time is also longer. Um, there is the advantage of no contrast and no entry into the thoracic space, um, but the estimated blood loss can also be substantially higher. Um, and so for this reason, um, at least in our lab, our general approach is to use the extrathoracic subclavian uh, vein approach first. Um, as an alternative, use the cephalic approach. And in patients who are smaller, um, especially those of advanced age, we consider using a micropuncture needle. Um, and then in infrequent cases, at least in our institution, um, use ultrasound guided access um, in these higher risk patients. So these next few questions are actually just um, sort of survey questions to kind of uh, understand practice around the country. So how often um, do you find yourself performing venograms in your device procedures for um, lead implantation? So super interesting. So a full 43% of you use um, ultrasound routinely for getting um, access. That's, that's interesting. Um, sometimes and rarely. I would say in our institution, we tend towards rarely, but um, it seems to be becoming more and more um, of a technique that people are adopting. Actually, um, Susan, this one was um, venograms. Rather than, I think oh, that was no. venograms? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, venograms. So, oh, routinely, sometimes, rarely. Okay, we almost always do a venogram. Thanks, sorry for, clar thanks for clarifying. 
Um, what about using the cephalic approach? I think um, people may have less practice with that. Okay. So I think that's probably, that seems to be um, the experience for most fellows. Um, you know, for whatever it's worth, it, it's, um, I think it's worth asking your attendings um, in the right circumstance, you know, maybe there are 12 cases that day, but you know, the, I guess no one has 12 cases these days, but um, under the right circumstances, you know, see if there's an opportunity to practice the cephalic approach. It's a good you know, kind of ace in the hole if there's some issue with getting, you know, axillary or subclavian access. Um, okay, and then the last one is how many use ultrasound for vascular access? Okay. So most are not using it, um, but it seems like there are some kind of uh, using ultrasound um, for leak implantation. That's interesting. Okay. All right, what about hematoma formation? So here's a question for you guys. We know that heparin um, is hemostasis, public enemy number one, sort of the John Dillinger of hemostasis. So what is a close second? There's a meta-analysis kind of looking at this uninterrupted anticoagulation, single antiplatelet therapy, or dual antiplatelet therapy? Okay, great. All right, so, um, so, the majority of you said dual antiplatelet therapy, and that is uh, correct. So this is a meta-analysis looking at a few thousand patients, um, looking at what um, you know strategy was associated with the highest risk of bleeding. And here's the heparin bridging strategy. We all know that heparin is the enemy, whether you know unfractionated or um, you know using Lovenox. Dual antiplatelet therapy is a very close second. Um, single antiplatelet therapy causes an increased risk of bleeding. And I think over time, we've all become more com comfortable with uninterrupted anticoagulation. Now, that doesn't mean that if a patient has a low chads vas score that you wouldn't hold heparin for their device implant if you have the opportunity to do so. But we know that if patients have a high thrombo thromboembolic risk, um, continuing anticoagulation is reasonable to do um, and these days, there are enough data um, for, with warfarin for sure, um, and even with a NOAX, it can be um, considered. Uh, the risk of major bleeding um, with the heparin bridging strategy and dual antiplatelet therapy in this meta-analysis was very similar, although the numbers uh, were small. And um, there was no significant difference in terms of the risk of thromboembolic events. Um, whether you continued heparin, um, anticoagulation, or anticoagulation was held. And so um, in terms of trying to avoid a hematoma, um, just think about whether or not, I think we're all very, we're so comfortable continuing anticoagulation, we almost don't think about stopping it. But if you can, um, for an elective device, definitely consider doing so. Um, antiplatelet therapy, if they're more than a year out from their stent, maybe you can hold their antiplatelets. Um, aim for an INR that's on the lower end if you can. Um, in terms of technique, try to avoid disrupting the fascial plane. I'm sure we've all kind of dealt with, you know, that sort of bleeding muscle that's continually oozing throughout the procedure. Um, pay meticulous attention to hemostasis. Um, and un under kind of judicious circumstances, you can use pressure dressings to kind of help with hemostasis. Okay, what about the risk of infection? So this is um, an analysis of um, the uh, Medicare ICD registry, including 200,000 patients implanted between 2006 and 2009. Um, the, this looked at infection occurring uh, within the short term, within six months. 
And it was very clear that dual chamber, that the addition of that lead led to an increased risk of infection. And that became statistically significant when compared to a single chamber implant um, for biventricular devices. And as we all know, generator replacement or anytime you kind of re-enter a pre-existing pocket, there's going to be an increased risk of infection compared to the initial implant. And that was found to be statistically significant here. There was another study that uh, just routinely swabbed um, pockets during generator changes and found that 42% of these generator changes um, had demonstrated the presence of bacteria without manifest infection. Now, in some of those cases, that could have been introduction from the skin at the time that generator changed, but certainly some of it reflects the presence of bacteria just sort of lurking and waiting to, to cause problems. Um, the six-month mortality was double that in um, patients with device infection versus those without. So it behooves us to do everything we can to avoid infection. So they performed a meta-analysis. We're familiar with the risk factors that increase the risk of infection. It's often multifactorial. But of these four, which posed pose the greatest risk for device infection, or which was associated with the highest risk of infection? Use of warfarin, renal failure on hemodialysis, previous valvular surgery, or the need for acute re-intervention after the initial implant. And Susan, there was a question that came through um, about uninterrupted DOAX for device implant. Yep. Um, how often do you do it? What kind of factors go into your decision making on whether you want to do it? So it's a good question. I would say um, there aren't as much data to support that, although there are case reports that will support doing that. So, you know, if a patient with tachybrady syndrome comes in with, you know, a long pause and needs, you know, an urgent um, device placed, then, um, you know, it's Friday and it's, you know, a question of waiting over the weekend versus proceeding. I'm comfortable proceeding. Um, but electively, I think um, because the, you know, the DOACs are so short acting, um, it's reasonable to just, just hold one or two doses and to proceed. Um, in terms of when to start afterwards, you know, the higher their CHAS gas score, you know, are they in AFib at the time, you know, the shorter the duration of being off the DOAC, but usually at least a minimum of 48 hours. And then one other question, any data to support changing gloves during the implant or during long implants? Ooh, changing gloves, that's so interesting. Um, uh, huh. I am actually not familiar with any data regarding that. Um, I have an anecdote of an attending who apparently changed his glove routinely like 12 times during device implants. I would recommend against that. Um, but uh, I mean, unless there's sort of like a clean and dirty pocket situation, you know, I typically don't, um, I don't change gloves. And I'm, I'm not aware of any data. Um, okay, great. Those are all great questions. So, um, all right, guys. So, yes, yeah, so you hit on the two kind of uh, most concerning factors. And um, indeed, it is acute reintervention after the initial implant. And um, that was the factor that was associated with, um, you know, the highest odds ratio for developing an infection. And so it just kind of drives home the point, the sort of you know, um, the importance of avoiding, you know, sort of these complications in the first place, because then you add the layer of, you know, not only the risk of the um, kind of re-intervention, but, you know, there's the, the risk of um, device infection that goes substantially up. Um, previous valvular surgery actually is a substantial um, risk. Um, in addition to any kind of re-implant that may not be um, acute per se, renal failure, chronic lung disease, um, cerebrovascular disease, and certainly warfarin use were associated with a higher risk. Um, I think we're all familiar with um, this chart showing which microbes are uh, most responsible for device infection. Two-thirds are the coag negative staph. Um, species, the and staph aureus is another two-thirds. Um, we have our gram-negatives here, 
and then sort of much less uh, frequently fungal infections, you know, anaerobes, and then m many times we, we come up sort of empty in terms of the membranes. All right, so um, this is kind of a busy slide, and I should have animated it, but I didn't. Um, but I think this it's a nice summary of kind of best practices. Um, most of it does not, you know, was not supported by randomized controlled data. Um, but, um, you know, certainly hold some enough logic that the British Heart Rhythm Society um, came up with these recommendations in terms of preventing device infection. So certainly we know, know that uh, pre-existing central venous catheters, whether it's a PIC line or temporary dialysis line um, or a temporary transvenous pacing line, which we would have a little bit more control over, um, you know, poses a high risk of device infection. The patient has a slow rate, but it's stable. It's reasonable to try to avoid that temporary transvenous pacing um, lead if you can. Um, there's no evidence for screening or empirically treating um, MRSA carriers, um, but if there's a known colonization, um, uh, it's, it's reasonable to treat. Um, continue warfarin in high-risk patients. Again, hold antiplatelets or anticoagulation in others if you can. Um, Patients are recommended to bathe or shower with soap prior to the procedure. We actually send patients home with these chlorhexidine scrubs to use the night before or the morning of the procedure. Um, if they're in patients, we also order these scrubs to be performed. Um, you wanna minimize the time that the device and the surgical equipment itself is left uncovered. If, a pa if there's some delay um, in the patient coming into the room and the table's already been opened, you know, we'll um, place a sterile drape over it. Um, during upgrades, I always take an antibiotic soap, uh, soap sponge and, you know, cover any sort of equipment that's going to be exposed for a long period of time. Um, clippers and not razors should be used to avoid microabrasion and introduction of bacteria. 2% chlorhexidine has actually been compared um, in a randomized fashion to um, iodine, and it's clearly um, associated with a lower risk of infection, so that's preferable. It should be left on for at least 30 seconds. So part of the um, effect of this scrub is the mechanical scrub, um, but there is a minimum amount of time that's required for the chlorhexidine to um, have its maximal effect. Um, IV antimicrobials have also been studied in a randomized controlled fashion, clearly um, probably the strongest benefit of anything we do. Um, it should be given within an hour prior to making that incision. Ideally, the infusion is complete within 20 minutes. Um, there's no data for repeat dosing after skin closure, although that's um, not uncommon for people to do. Um, and as we all know, beta-lactams are superior to vancomycin to the point that, you know, especially for an elective procedure, it's very much worth um, sending these patients to allergy to debunk their you know, childhood allergy to penicillin, which oftentimes um, can be proven not to be a true allergy. Um, and then finally, a second slide on best practices, um, though local sort of, you know, um, irrigation uh, with antibiotic solution is not proven. I think we all do it. Um, capsulectomy was actually looked at in a randomized controlled uh, fashion um, in 258 patients. There was a higher rate of hematoma, which um, if you've ever tried to do a capsulectomy, you'll, you'll understand why. Um, the rate of superficial infection and mortality was no different. Um, so it's not recommended routinely, but certainly for patients who have a deep pocket infection, you want to get all of that tissue out. Um, and uh, the British Medical, or the Heart Rhythm Society had no specific recommendations about wound closure. Um, just, uh, you know, to drive home the point, avoid other complications in the first place, and certainly patients who've been hospitalized for a long period of time have a higher risk of um, infection, and those patients will kind of double dose with both beta-lactams and, um, and vancomycin. What about pouches? So um, that was a big question mark for a long period of time, and now we have some data to, to look at. Um, there's the RAPID trial, um, including 7,000 patients who were randomized, um, first published in 2019 for 12-month data, and they just published actually their 36-month data um, earlier this year, and um, included pocket uh, revision patients, um, patients who are undergoing uh, replacement or upgrade or a new multi-lead device, um, and they were randomized to either antimicrobial pouch versus none. Um, the 
primary endpoint what point was infection resulting in extraction or revision, um, the need for long-term suppressive antibiotics or death, and the secondary endpoint was um, procedure-related or system-related complications, meaning, you know, does the addition of that bulky pouch, would that add to problems with the pocket or erosion or pocket discomfort? And what they found ultimately was that actually the primary endpoint was met. There was a statistically significantly um, lower risk of major CIED infection. Um, it was actually primarily driven by a lower rate of pocket infection. Um, bacteremia or endocarditis occurred um, at a similar rate, although those numbers were quite low. Um, and that um, significance and difference, you know, bore out at 12 months. Um, and with the newer sort of 36 um, month data, the hazard ratio remains statistically significantly different at 0.64. Um, interestingly, looking at sort of subgroups, it was clear that the benefit was driven by um, patients who were undergoing some kind of high energy replacement um, or upgrade, um, and they seem to drive um, the majority of that benefit. And so given sort of the cost um, of the pouches, which um, can be substantial, and the number needed to, to treat being about 77 patients in the, in the um, rapid trial, um, our group, I think, in general, um, is, uh, will not use it for all of these patients, um, but will use it sort of more selectively in these patients undergoing kind of high energy device um, upgrade or replacement. Okay, what about perforation or tamponade? So, well, it turns out it happens. This is um, a patient of mine from last fall, um, who you can see has a substantial um, amount of fluid around his um, heart here. So um, that's just for your viewing pleasure while we review this slide. This is one study looking at 3,000 patients, um, 26 uh, patients of whom um, had cardiac perforation. There was a predominance of female sex. Um, symptoms occurred in 72% of patients with thoracic pain being um, the leading symptom that people reported. The time to perforation in general was um, short at 3.5 days, um, but even very late perforations could be seen to occur. Um, most of the perforations occurred in the right ventricle, all of them through the apex. 88% um, of these were active fixation leads, um, and 15% uh, were right atrial leads um, causing the perforation. The fusion was seen in about 60%, and about one third of those required, um, like my patient, required temp, um, sorry, drainage of their um, effusion. Um, one patient out of these 26 ended up also having a pneumothorax. Here's an example of how that might happen. Um, that lead can go through and through and actually enter the lung cavity. Um, the most common finding in terms of lead parameters is a high threshold. Suddenly the lead is no longer in good contact with the myocardium. You can get abnormal sensing where suddenly your um, sensing comes down um, and in about a quarter of patients, um, diaphragm stem can be seen. Interestingly with these, especially with acute perforations, those leads can actually just be withdrawn. And in the vast majority of these patients in 25 out of 26 patients, those leads could simply be withdrawn and you know, the lovely forgiving um, right-sided myocardium will simply just contract and seal off that little hole you tried to make um, in the myocardium. In one case, um, a patient ended up having um, kind of worsening tamponade and required um, an urgent thoracotomy. And so, you know, um, it's not unreasonable, um, you know, especially if the, the leads look um, not to be totally through and through um, to consider withdrawing these just in the EP lab. All right, so um, that was uh, minimizing device complications. Um, Sorry, do you mind? Um, there were a few questions about device stuff before we go on. Okay. Um, a lot of questions about infectious stuff, interestingly. So one was uh, when you do a generator change, do you avoid the old incision or are you comfortable just incising directly over the old incision? Well, it's a good question. I mean, there is sort of, um, you know, a 
theoretical issue of less vascularity um, in that scar tissue and potentially an increased you know, risk of poor wound healing. Um, I have to say, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any device that, um, you know, argues against doing that. I've done these procedures with plastic surgeons and, um, you know, I suppose the weight of the advice of a few plastic surgeons may not be enormous, but, um, I tend to go through the old incision and, um, you know, have had reasonable outcomes and have not seen data, you know, to indicate otherwise. And then there was a question about post-procedure um, prophylaxis for antibiotic use, you know, five to seven days after um, implant. Mm -hmm. So that has been looked at. I don't have that in my slides, but there is no benefit to five to seven days of antibiotics compared to just the pre-procedural antibiotic instilled within that kind of like one hour, 20 minutes before the incision is made. There's not even, you know, evidence for antibiotics after 24 hours, though I would say um, there's certainly a robust, you know, kind of practice of doing that. But five to seven days, you know, unless there's an active device infection, there's definitely not uh, evidence for benefit there. Uh, there was a question about if you have someone who has an indwelling device who's going for another procedure, is there any need to think about antibiotic um, use for the other procedure, PCI or ablation? Um, they said dialysis catheter placement, but I assume IR is giving antibiotics in that situation. But That's a good question. So, um, so I think physiologically our thought is that after three months, um, the leads uh, should be well endothelialized and the, you know, pocket should be, um, you know, encapsulated um, so that, you know, the risk of bacteria, you know, sticking to that hardware is going to be on the low end. And so kind of routine, you know, antibiotic prophylaxis is not, you know, routinely recommended in those cases. It's not included in sort of like the routine endocarditis prophylaxis, for example. Um, you know, I've had patients who, you know, had some like dental emergency, you know, a week or two after their acute implant. And for those patients, I will give them, you know, prophylaxis. But if it's outside that three month window, um, it's not, you know, it's not routine practice to give antibiotic prophylaxis before other procedures. And then a couple of questions about micropuncture. Just is, is there any um, data that there's actually reduced risk of pneumothorax with the micropuncture, and what about using the micropuncture for a closed cephalic access rather than um, a full cut down? I'm not familiar with that technique, but it sounds intriguing. Um, as far as use of micropuncture and you know risk of, of you know vascular damage or pneumothorax, I'm not. Uh, aware of any data, but I haven't looked, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, I will say that um, uh, I did mention it, you know, in sort of older patients. Um, I think theoretically you're probably less likely or you're more likely to create a small hole versus a large hole, uh, which is the rationale for using it in those kind of higher risk situations. Sounds great. I think uh, that pretty much covered it. Okay, great. Great question. Okay, all right, so that was devices. Um, we'll talk about minimizing um, ablation complications. And, you know, I have given versions of this talk, you know, maybe for seven or eight years now. And I will say that this is like the one area in which, um, you know, practice has really changed for the better. So, um, this is just kind of a very busy slide looking at contemporary rates of complications in some recent ablation studies. And um, the, you know, types of complications were counted differently, and so the numbers are kind of a little bit all over the place. Um, but the point of this slide is just to point out that vascular complications, you know, um, in sort of these studies in this era, you know, made up uh, a reasonable portion of these kind of overall complications. Um, but I think over time, we're going to see that change with the, um, the routine use of um, ultrasound. So, um, you know, I think a lot of times 
because we have the ultrasound, it's very tempting to just grab the ultrasound, take your picture, smush the vein, and you know, go in. Um, you know, in addition to doing that, I think it's useful to like have in your head this picture um, and you know, have in your mind what exactly you're targeting. And your goal is to really hit the sweet spot, you know, of the femoral vein within the femoral triangle. And so um, what I would encourage you to do um, is to step one, always take the patient's, you know, foot and or knee and, you know, externally rotate so that you're kind of frog legging or at least kind of splaying out and opening up, you know, the, the, that space, the femoral triangle. Oftentimes you can see the femoral artery on top of the vein and if you kind of externally rotate, you can bring those um, a little bit more separated from each other. Um, the next step is to palpate the anatomical landmarks. You really, you know, should know when you're putting that ultrasound probe down, you know, where the inguinal ligament is, where that should kind of be in your mind as you're getting access. You want to palpate the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis, understanding that the inguinal ligament is going to kind of run in between those. Um, and your goal ultimately is to, you know, to avoid puncturing too high. Um, we know that the vein is, you know, kind of following the pelvic floor and so is not going to be compressible beyond the inguinal ligament and cause retroperitoneal, retroperitoneal bleeding. We also don't want to stick too low. Um, we'll start running into the femoral arterial branches, um, causing a higher risk of AV fistula. Um, and we also want to avoid the um, superficial saphenous vein. Um, so here's another picture. This is sort of the sweet spot in terms of the, the femoral artery um, and kind of, you know, understanding that the bifurcation um, is going to be on the lower end. Um, and uh, the bifurcation is also a guide in terms of, you know, where to stick the femoral vein. Typically, that's going to be on the lower end of the femoral triangle and you're going to want to stick the vein a little bit higher um, and keep the saphenous vein in view. Um, or out of view to kind of avoid hitting it, understand where that is. So um, the real game changer has been ultrasound. And I don't think I made a question for this in terms of um, who's using ultrasound or not. I think most people are these days. I would say, you know, seven or eight years ago, it wasn't 100% for sure. Um, but this is a meta-analysis um, of studies looking at the use of ultrasound versus not. Um, this is one um, randomized controlled trial. The rest are just, you know, sort of observational studies. And it's clear that, you know, there's a substantially lower risk of complications to the tune of a risk ratio of 0.29% um, of major vascular complications. And that includes all these um, categories of, you know, inadvertent arterial puncture, um, you know, groin pain, um, and uh, there's a reduced, you know, kind of access time. The success rate is also higher um, uh, with the ultrasound, um, sort of real-time ultrasound guided approach. And when, you know, 3,000 of these patients were looked at, um, those patients undergoing pulmonary vein isolation where, um, you know, sticking the vessel cleanly is, you know, even more important um, you know, similarly, there was a radically reduced uh, risk ratio with ultrasound. So I think we're all kind of familiar with the technique. Um, these slides are just to point out um, that uh, standard 18 gauge needles oftentimes are not well visualized um, directly. You can sort of indirectly see it sort of displacing the soft tissue and then maybe tenting the vessel. But if you have, you know, um, if you can use a micropuncture needle, the tip shows up as a very kind of bright, um, you know, uh, ultrasonic signal here. And you can see it sitting right on top of the vein here. Um, the next step is to look for it tenting um, the vessel without impinging on the um, artery at all. Um, and then finally kind of seeing it pop through um, into the main body of the, um, of the lumen. All right, so um, that's been a real game changer. What about minimizing the risk of perforation and tamponade um, during catheter ablation? So um, these are kind of older data, but seem to be fairly consistent um, with kind of recent complication rates. 
Um, maybe these rates are a little bit less than 1% um, these days with contact um, force information. Um, in the first contact force study looking um, at contact force versus non-contact force, there was a 2.48% uh, um, incidence of uh, perforation. That was probably a function of this being sort of, um, you know, early use of the stiffer catheter. Um, but what was useful out of that study um, was that there was a trend toward a greater percentage time um, in higher contact force, meaning greater than or equal to 40 grams. So, you know, I think generally speaking, we try not to, you know, surpass 30 grams on a routine basis. You know, if you're spending time in the 40s, you know, you're sort of um, looking for trouble. Um, this was a study looking at perforation force um, in vitro in swine and human cardiac tissue. Um, a smaller catheter size, you know, required reduced force to perforate. Um, and the minimum force required to perforate the tissue was 38 grams. So again, kind of, you know, um, staying below 30 grams is probably ideal, um, you know, less than, you know, kind of 25 is, is even better. Um, so what are the strategies to avoid perforation? <laughs> Don't push too hard. Um, you know, steam pops are more likely to cause perforation if the force is higher versus less high. Um, you know, another point of potential perforation is at the time of transeptal puncture. I think we're becoming more and more comfortable with um, kind of performing that with less fluoro. Um, you know, as we do that, we want to be very comfortable with our ice views and take advantage of, you know, um, our 3D mapping options in terms of understanding the anatomy at that time. Um, don't push too hard. Um, and I would say the most important um, piece of, of perforation management is recognizing it early. So, you know, no one wants to have caused a perforation and, you know, you're heart sinks into your gut and your blood turns cold when, you know, whoever is watching the blood pressure tells you, you know, hmm, the pressure is getting a little soft. Um, but the most important thing is to just, you know, keep it in mind and, you know, look at that LEO view, look with your ice. Um, and, you know, if you recognize it early and you treat it early, um, it can be managed in a reasonable fashion. Um, the enemy of complication management is denial, and this can happen, it's human nature, um, and the important thing is to just run towards those possibilities and, um, and to, to recognize it and treat it early. Okay, finally, um, the last issue is um, minimizing the risk of stroke. Um, you know, over 10 years ago, it was recognized that uninterrupted warfarin was a very reasonable approach for um, not only reducing the risk of stroke during AF ablation, but, um, you know, not necessarily seeing an increased risk um, of bleeding during the procedures. Um, this is an older study uh, looking at um, sort of INR ranges and the incidence of complication. It's interesting because the vast majority of these um, bars are made up of groin hematomas and vascular complications, which are probably, you know, a lot lower in this era of um, ultrasound guided access. Nevertheless, um, there's probably going to be a similar trend. And the point of this slide is just to show you that there is kind of this sweet spot between 2 and 2.5 with the INR, um, and that clopidogrel makes a substantial difference in terms of, you know, the risk of bleeding. Um, what about uninterrupted NOACs? We now have um, a substantial body of data supporting that use um, with these studies and this meta-analysis, um, which was um, showing that um, there was uh, either a, a trend or um, statistically significantly um, lower risk of complication for major bleeding, tamponade, um, and composite outcomes in NOAC versus um, uh, uninterrupted uh, warfarin. And this informed the 2017 um, HRS uh, guidelines on the use of anticoagulation periprocedurally. Um, the use of uninterrupted dabigatran and rivaroxaban got class one indications, while um, un uninterrupted um, other NOACs um, got a two-way indication.
Um, also, the approach of holding one or two doses prior to the procedure received uh, 2A indication. Um, and this is one study that looked at um, you know, outcomes comparing those sort of uninterrupted single dose skipped versus 24 hour skipped, showing that there was no significant differences in terms of major bleeding, uh, though there were you know, few events um, overall. All right, so those are kind of the nuts and bolts of trying to minimize um, complications. Um, and Is I just- tonight? Sorry, oh, yeah. before you go on, because this next part is obviously very important, but um, there was one question. Have you ever seen a significant RP bleed with just venous access? With just venous access? Um, I feel like the answer is probably, well, I don't know, that's a good question. In the era of ultrasound guided access, the answer is no. Um, just because I think we're so much more precise about, you know, kind of where we're sticking versus like blindly sticking very deeply. Yeah, I, I can think of one and it was non-ultrasound access and it was at a point where people weren't comfortable doing the procedures on warfarin and were bridging. And mm -hmm. that's the only, that's the only one I can think of. Okay. So I think in the modern era that risk is probably, you know, extremely low, extremely low more to do with technique versus, you know, um, venous versus arterial access. Um, okay, good. So here are my last two slides. Um, so these are about just sort of like um, discussing complications with patients, how to approach it, because it can be difficult and, you know, awkward and scary. Um, and so, um, <laughs> In my 10 plus years of being in practice, I've had to do this more than just a few times. Um, and what I've learned is that, you know, just start up by being frank. Just be frank and be clear. Don't obfuscate. Don't try to, you know, skate around it, deny it. You know, just be clear. This thing happened. You know, um, the lead went through the heart muscle and there's, you know, blood that's leaking around the heart um, and just, just be very frank, be very clear. Um, you know, give the patients a roadmap about what to expect. So because this has happened, you know, we're gonna perform these tests. Um, you know, what are the possible interventions that may occur? You know, there is gonna be surveillance follow-up. This is how often we're gonna see you. This is what we're gonna be looking for. And, you know, give them a sense of what the possible outcomes are. The possible outcomes with my patient who, you know, had the perforation are that, you know, will drain this um, effusion, you know, the lead was functioning just fine and that we'll be able to leave it in place and, you know, that will be kind of the end of it long term. There's a small chance that later down the line there will be a lead problem, in which case we'll have to move it then. Um, make sure to include family, um, you know, if there are loved ones there. Again, it just, it's just, it's embarrassing, you know, it's mortifying to have caused a complication. And so I think as humans, our first impulse is to, um, is to try to hide or just, you know, hide from it, hide from the family, hide from the patient, you know, and you just have to not do that. Um, you know, make sure the patient and the family know that you are with them, you know, on this journey of, you know, recovering from this complication you want to stay in close contact with them. And I say this specifically because um, there are circumstances in which, you know, um, physicians don't, you know, stay in close contact with their patients and, you know, take the direction of moving, you know, away from the patient and not advocating from them uh, or advocating for them, you know, throughout the process. Um, I kind of surveyed a bunch of slightly more more gray hair than I am, electrophysiologist, about what advice would you give um, fellows about how to approach a complication? And I think, you know, the most concise um, advice that, that I heard was to just own it, you know. Um, I think it's just very tempting to kind of like deny anything's happening or to just minimize what's happening, but it's just important to just own it. It's okay to express contrition, um, you know, I suppose lawyers might tell you something different, but you know, 
I mean, your patient is a human being, you're a human being. For me, I find it, you know, useful for them and for me to tell them how I feel, which is that I'm sorry that this happened and it's okay to say that. Um, do not abandon your patients, make sure yourself, uh, make yourself readily available to them. Um, I give my cell phone number to these patients um, so that they can feel that they have a lifeline, you know, at a moment's notice. Um, so this is the last slide. So again, try to resist denial, you know, at the time that it's happening, you know, after it's happened, um, acknowledging a complication can be difficult, um, but that denial can delay recognition of the complication and appropriate treatment. And you're always going to be better off treating early, um, than later, um, resist the urge to ignore bad news. Um, the only you know, worse thing than bad news is bad news that isn't addressed um, right away. Um, and again, I'll just, because it's so important, I'll say it again, do not abandon your patient. Be sure they understand that you're as concerned as they are um, about what they're going through. Um, and then finally, I think it's really important, you know, I suppose there might be some superhuman people out there who are not adversely affected by such events. Um, I'm not one of those people. So acknowledge the to yourself that this is difficult for you. You know, you will go through feelings of guilt, you know, for having, you know, I mean, at your hands, your decision-making caused this, causing this issue, questioning your own skill and judgment, you know, there's fear of litigation. All of those things are, are feelings that you may have. Maybe you won't have them, great, you know, but if you do have them, that's very normal. Um, the most important, these are like really negative feelings that can very much like eat away at you and it's so important to, to get it out and not just let it kind of fester. Um, so it's important to discuss with a trusted colleague. I've told Ms. Sean about all my <laughs> interesting things that have happened. I feel fortunate to have you know, those colleagues around. Um, talk with you know, your mentors. Um, it's also important to discuss with your family and friends if they can be a source of maybe not like medical advice, but emotional support. Um, and then just know that all proceduralists experience procedural complications. Um, we've all had them and we've all gone through kind of these same feelings. And I think the most important thing, you'll go through those stages and it will be hard, you know, but get it out of the open, talk to people about it. Um, and in the end, learn from that experience and, and just be better. And part of, you know, the reason I, talk to all of my colleagues about, you know, adverse things that have happened is that, you know, I'm hoping that maybe it's like a little nugget that, you know, will be useful to them in the future. So um, anyway, that's it. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks, Susan. That was great. And I agree. I think that last part is so incredibly important for everyone to hear every trainee. Um, and does make a big difference how you handle these. Uh, there were a few other questions, which I think um, I'll let you field. So the one was about using heparin during chest venous access cases. So SVT ablations, et cetera, do you routinely use heparin? And post-procedure, do you give aspirin or anything else afterwards? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so once, um, access has been obtained, then yes, we give heparin, um, or I give heparin during SVT procedures. So typically, you know, I give 3,000 of um, heparin at the beginning of the procedure, I give 1,000 every hour. Um, and if they're very small or much older, sometimes I'll just give 2,000 instead of 3,000. Um, for uh, left-sided procedures, um, if it's, you know, just like a, a pathway um, without extensive ablation, I will give um, a full dose of aspirin for a month, um, you know, based on, you know, purely sort of anecdotal data. Um, young women, if they're smokers on um, oral contraceptive pills, I will also, um, even if it's a right-sided ablation, give them a full aspirin. And then there was a question about AFib ablation. Uh, do you routinely give protamine afterwards? And, you know, if, do you do them uninterrupted on DOACs? And if someone missed a dose, when do you restart the DOAC after the procedure? Um, so 
I typically do hold the DOAC prior to the procedure. We'll hold it, you know, 24 hours beforehand. Um, although, again, there are, you know, plenty of data showing that you can give it uninterrupted, although some of those protocols would, you know, divide the rivaroxaban to 10 in the morning and 10 after the procedure, um, or decrease the apixaban to two and a half on the day of the procedure. So there are all sorts of nuances in terms of, you know, um, sort of how the micromanagement around the procedure, but, um, you know, there's enough data to support kind of holding, you know, the one or two doses prior to the procedure. Um, and then if they've missed a dose, well, we ask them to miss a dose, so that doesn't make a difference in terms of our practice. And we typically do give protamine um, to reverse heparin at the end of the procedure. And then I think this is Melissa Robinson makes a very good point. Uh, one of the more difficult aspects of complication avoid avoidance is M&M &M and tracking complications. Any advice for fellows coming out of practice, uh, practice? Because some hospitals don't routinely support that. Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I've only been at academic centers that kind of require that. Um, and so I suppose if you are out in practice and it's not required, I think it is incredibly useful to keep track of sort of, you know, the numbers and types of procedures that you're doing and to somehow try to keep track of those numbers. I mean, I know that our, um, our lab has the ability to pull those, you know, numbers of procedures up. And so maybe, you know, as a practitioner, you don't need to keep track of your number of procedures, but to keep a log of your complications, and then you could get your denominator when needed um, to make that calculation. Um, and if anyone has any other advice, you know, in terms of doing that or experience, that'd be, feel free to weigh in. Yeah, I think that's good advice and stuff that we've told our fellows when they're coming out to try and initiate it if they can, but I will tell you that there has been um, some pushback at places about talking about complications, so. You know, that is a good point, and I was kind of trying to decide how much to talk about it, but there is a whole kind of um, risk management, you know, um, uh, risk management aspect of, um, you know, complications. There are, um, I mean, it probably is reasonable to talk with your institution about their, you know, kind of approach to managing conversations, you know, in terms of complications. Um, you know, I have had many conversations with risk management at Northwestern and, um, you know, I feel like they take a very kind of open approach and, you know, um, feel that the best policy is for um, the physicians to, you know, express, you know, their feelings about what has, you know, transpired. Feel contrite, express contrition. You know, it's not wrong to apologize, you know. Um, but there is, you know, some risk management issues uh, or risk management sort of strategies, I suppose. That doesn't sound like a great word, but um, risk management issues to consider, you know, in terms of, of managing all that. But I will tell you that, you know, um, you know, risk management starts with the moment that you meet your patient. You know, if your patient feels like you know them and you understand them and you care about them, and, you know, if something occurs that you continue to care about them and that you're interested in their well-being, it's kind of, you know, incredible how much, you know, um, room your patients will give you to be a human being and to, um, you know, not be perfect um, and to just go on that journey with you. 